Yes. Yeah, and uh, just an, an, another heads up. I, I just decided for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to go clockwise when, when I ad address you individually. So, so you thank know. you so much, Michael. <laughs> yes. Okay. So. So one last chance to take a drink of water. Great. Well, this is going to be fun. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. So my computer says one more minute or maybe it's less. Our first guest is Matthew Craig. He works at Immer Diamond. Yes, I also see. Also nice. Yeah, because the diamond industry is actually making huge progress with regards to the artificial diamonds. Yes. We can soon not compare them anymore. Right, right. That's good. Yes. Well, it looks like it is now 4.30. So welcome, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> 4.30 here in, in Central European time. So uh, welcome panelists, welcome guests. And... Um, my name is Michael Dury. I'm a purpose-driven change and communication specialist with the global impact organization, The Digital Economist. And a number of my colleagues with that organization are also speaking uh, today. So we're, we're part of this. Uh, Horizons is a partner organization of, of ours. So I would just like to uh, begin by uh, addressing the topic of this discussion, the purposeful business. And I wonder if you could just talk about what purpose means for your organization and for the clients you serve, or Andre, in your case, the teachers you serve and the young people, of course, that they in turn serve. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about what purpose, how you define purpose. And I'd like to begin for simplicity's sake at the top of my screen and continue clockwise. So that means Andre, you go first, please. Thank you so much, Michael, um, and to my fellow panelists and to the, to the visitors and guests. So the purposeful business I think we've seen over the last several decades a move to a more thoughtful economy in some respects. Um, and in our respect, it's been a particular issue because I've been based in the wine industry in South Africa for a long time, or based in the US importing wines. I've watched an ecosystem of great generation of wealth and sort of economic growth and prosperity in some respects in the face of great adversity and also inequality. And you have to realize at some point in your life, what ultimately defines the purpose and what defines an ecosystem and how can I be a participant in improvements as opposed to a participant in inequality and, and imbalance. So I think for me, the purpose is realizing that I wake up in the morning and I contribute hopefully towards um, an inclusive economy, that I contribute towards the upliftment of those perhaps less fortunate, and that at least from a, a, a global point of view, that we all realize we live in an ecosystem that is so tightly balanced. We have to understand that uh, the economy is as important as the environment, is as important as obviously humanity. And so we're involved in early childhood teacher training because we believe that the origins of humankind from you know, maternal health all the way through to early childhood is the single most important foundation to ensure an economy and a global circumstance that speaks to equality and a more egalitarian approach and a cleaner environmental approach. It just pisses me that we have taken so long and continue to take so long to reach this stasis or consensus where purposeful business should be mandated. We should understand from early years and from school years that we must be part of a, a more purposeful future. We are interconnected. We're becoming more and more interconnected. And it's a real wish that this pandemic's disastrous effects will ultimately pave the way for some real brightening of certain approaches that we take to business and interaction and respect amongst each other as cultures and communities. 
So I think purpose is waking up in the morning feeling like you're really contributing to the betterment of humankind. Yes, and, and I wonder if you could just say in a couple of words what your organization does. And uh... So we, our uh, U.S. Foundation is actually sponsoring the development of an early childhood teacher training system in South Africa. We found an, an institute here, and it's about professionalizing an industry that is actually completely marginalized in a community that is incredibly inequitous. So what we've done is to say, let's professionalize, let's be able to operationally allow a, a very scalable opportunity that allows women who currently are earning far too little money in a month. Uh, the teacher training standards are super inferior. As uh, so we've realized, our job is to create micropreneurs of these women to become community shapers. So in the process, we spend our raised capital to train these teachers they go through a deeply human process where they, I think, grow tremendously in their own appreciation of themselves. And they realize that their role play is to craft humanity in a sense. It's a real deep dive into each individual. So with that process, you realize that an ecosystem where literally tens of thousands of teachers that spend their every day coaching and leading hundreds of thousands, if not millions of children, over a, century, over a generation, that transforms an enormous amount economically. So the economic value add of the work we do can be amplified over 25 years significantly. If you look at the current research globally that shows the investments in early childhood of a high quality, certainly in things like teacher training, yield rather dramatic results over time. And to me, if we look at long-term investing or dividends or you know early savings, this is one of the greatest uh, dividend yielding processes in the world. And so our organization is trying to facilitate a professional ecosystem that over the next 25 years can grow into a countrywide opportunity for early childhood as a professional, a very professional domain of employment. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, Rogerio, you are in investment banking and of course, investment banking as, as a field of, of expertise you have a tremendous amount of influence and potential for, for driving business. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you discuss purpose and, and how you see purpose in your consultations with clients. Uh, thank you. And uh, first of all, uh, to say hello to fellow panelists and to the, the audience. Uh, in the room. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, purpose, I would define purpose, not just the one purpose, uh, that is probably a long time ago. Today, organizations have multiple purposes or serve multiple purposes. Um, uh, and in, in, in my, my personal view is that uh, usually what one could consider purpose is, say, return to shareholders. That is something that in an organization, uh, I mean, we, you, you cannot exist. Uh, everything is to provide a return to your shareholders it is no longer a business, it becomes a hobby. So, <clears throat> and therefore it's important that we cannot forget that. Uh, but on top of that, so we have to serve and advise clients uh, and help clients to grow in, in their industries or advise clients in their growth. So uh, we define it as a service. So this is a culture of service, a culture of excellence in everything we do. So make sure that uh, the purpose of company is to be an excellent company. As in the old days, there was uh, a book, uh, I cannot remember the author, but it was In Search of Excellence. Um, and uh, I cannot remember the author, I apologize for that. But I mean, uh, if you excel yourself in what you do, uh, I mean, it serves the purpose of the company uh, and service to your clients. So, and um, you also have to have respect. So the purpose of being a, a, a respect both your uh, colleagues, your fellow colleagues, as well as your clients and then treat uh, everybody with respect. That's very, very, very important and respect and integrity. So it is part of the business. And then uh, it is something that uh, investment banking in the past was accused of, 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 in, of the past uh, financial crisis. That, I have some opinions about that, but, uh, uh, but the integrity is is part of the business. It's part of our purpose. We cannot exist as a company or an entity serving clients if we don't have integrity. Um, 
The other thing that, the other purpose that I see important for a company is uh, what we can, could call the purpose of stewardship, yeah. meaning that uh, e the organization is always survive you. Um, and the organization is more important than the individual. And therefore, uh, your purpose, uh, you serve the company by leaving the company better than you found it. So when you reach the end of your term, then you go and say the company is now better than, than it was before. Um, and, and, and also, uh, we should not forget that uh, uh, more recently, um, the purpose of being of the what is called now, it's very important, the uh, ESG approach. Uh, uh, so the environmental, the social, and the governance of, 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 of the companies is also a purpose that we need to serve and to make sure, for instance, nowadays that our clients also comply with that. So it's it's a criteria, or a criterion to uh, this to evaluate, to so, so to speak, our clients is how compliant are they with the ESG uh, 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 framework. Uh, the other thing that is also important is the another purpose of the organization is diversity and inclusion. So, um, so uh, we must make sure in the organization that one an organization that puts in practice diversity and inclusion policies is much better regarded by the clients than an organization that doesn't. So you can, for instance, you, if you grow coffee in somewhere in Africa and uh, the, the crops are done by children, so this is not in today's time acceptable. So uh, it is something that we should consider, not to engage with the client that have that kind of practice. And uh, so, those objectives that I just described, so or these purposes of the organization, so are the mix that it is difficult today to say one purpose is the purpose. Okay, there is a mission, yes, but, but one thing is uh, to achieve that mission, or to comply with that mission, or not, or to carry out that mission, mission, you need to have a lot of things in this mix of purposes in the organization, that's how I would define it. Yes, and that's really interesting. And I think it, it reminds me of uh, an interview I, I held many years back, just in the wake of the financial crisis, with a brilliant woman named Julie Zimmerman. She is, I believe, at Harvard, a professor, and she also runs a sustainability consulting firm with with her husband, who was with the EPA at the time. And one of the things that she said in this interview is that the Dow Sustainability Index fared much better through the crisis than the rest of the Dow. And her take on that was that a sustainably run company simply has all around better risk management. Yes. So yes. there is. I spoke. I don't percent agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Now, Natalie, th this is a question I'm, I'm especially interested in hearing from you, or the answer to the question, of course, I mean, <laughs> uh, because it's it's an area that's very close to my heart, because I, I also do change communications and very purpose-oriented. And one of the things that I've discovered over the years is that it's important to work with cultural models to understand the purpose of an organization and to help steer an organization in the direction of that purpose to support the those ambitions, to identify and, the, and support those ambitions. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what cultural models you use in your organization and also, of course, explain the organization you, you are, are running. 
Thanks. Yes. I, um, so this topic is what I've dedicated my life to. Um, I launched a company called Blank Space that's really about the future that we have to go to where business and purpose is part of everything that we do. Um, it's a strategy firm. So we build both the programmatic strategy around ESG as well as how we're talking about it with the world, um, uh, the whole the whole picture. Um, I come from Unilever. I was doing this work in brand purpose uh, for their prestige portfolio, working across the portfolio with brands and founders. Um, and the need just keeps growing. And I have a little bit of a different perspective in the fact that I actually think the viability of a company um, must be a future forward brand, which means inherently this has to be at the center of, of the why of what they're operating on. You know, if you're creating a company today in this marketplace and you don't have um, the reason that you exist for the people you serve and the products you're creating and um, a, a focus on how you're impacting the communities that you're in, then you're really not set up to succeed. And at Unilever, we started actually making decisions in our acquisitions based on those alignments. So I have a very strong, I'm a little bit more of a rebel on this panel because I, I think that some of these older institutions are, are going to be outdated pretty quickly. Um, and on and, and to your specific point, I really um, do think that culture and what's happening in the time is so prevalent to, to how you build these strategies. Um, this year for my client WW, which is uh, formerly known as Weight Watchers, we built the Healthy Living Coalition, which is actually now 25 brands and growing with Bank of America, JP Morgan, big, big financial institutions like that, as well as these up and coming businesses that are looking at food and proteins in a progressive way, like Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods. Um, and this, this large group of companies that have come together to think about food systems. So it's not just like, this is what I do and, and this is how I can, you know, take my carbon footprint down. It's actually like, how are we uh, impacting food systems around us? How are our employees able to eat well, healthy fruits and vegetables? Are we making a donation to a food bank but our, our lowest paid worker can't actually afford these, these fresh fruits and vegetables to be healthy? And I think during a time when you have a pandemic, we realize how interconnected we are as a society and we're only as healthy as you know the most vulnerable. So it's really opened the eyes of, of um, the future of this work. And even in some of the other clients that aren't as directly related to, let's say, health, we can look at the, the change in retail, right? We've moved just like these. We were opening this conversation and just all talking about what the future of virtual communication for these meetings looks like. But really, that's how we're going to be connecting as consumers and choosing products and choosing the companies and choosing our banking. All of these things are really coming down to how you show up in our home, how you show up in our lives, um, and, and the decisions that you make as a company to set up for success. Um, and I really, I really think it'll be a distinct factor whether who's here and who's not in ten years. Mm -hmm. But I'd be interested in also hearing. Well, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm also interested in hearing about the the actual nitty gritty cultural work, uh, so to speak, where the rubber meets the road. Just to give you an example, I had a consulting project with a chemicals firm some years back, and they had just recently begun taking their sustainability team somewhat more seriously, investing a little bit more, bringing more people on, but they still felt very neglected and underprivileged and uh, disrespected and, and so on, uh, understandably. So it was like a, a litany, just a kind of a, a constant recurring thing that they were saying, well, we can't talk about sustainability. We use petroleum-based ingredients. We can't talk about sustainability. We use silicone in our products. So the challenge was, and this was true, of course, but the challenge was to say, well, now, wait a minute. You may not be there yet. But you understand the thing or two about sustainability. And with the right mindset, you can make progress. And I don't know if you're familiar with the book Cradle to Cradle by Michael Braungart and O'Donoghue. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> There's that statement in it. Less bad is no good. Mm -hmm. 
And I understand that and I appreciate it, but I think it's a very dangerous statement to make because it, it can be very defeatist. It can, can make people just throw up their arms and say, we can't do anything anyway. So this project was about getting more attention to these people, getting more support from colleagues and creating more pride and more importance for the topic of sustainability, partly by marrying it with innovation. So this was a cultural shift in mindset. I, I, I wonder. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah no, you, I completely agree with you. I, I do think I, you know, coming from someone like Unilever, I, 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 th I see this work as a bridge. I'm not here to, um, you know, tear down institutions. I'm here to build a bridge to the future and, right. and the ways that we can do that. Um, I think that the UN SDGs um, have been helpful for some, for, you know, the business KPI mindset um, of thinking long-term and in, in small increments of how they can shift towards healthier practices in the business. Um, and I, I think that small movements like that have helped CEOs potentially to see that aha. Um, I, I definitely think this comes from the top. There's, there's, it's very hard to be um, in, let's just say, like, I don't really think that something should just live in a corporate social responsibility department that is failing, right? It has to be something that is part of the brand purpose and the brand DNA from the very top um, and, and really where people feel that this is the heart and soul of why the company is there. Um, even if your profit alignment is outside of a tr something that might be transformative, that's where the bridge work is. If, if you have someone at the top in leadership who sees um, this is what we do for a business and this is how we can actually be helpful. And you embed that into your teams. Um, and you can, you can really see that shift. People become inspired to work for you. Um, I, I was one of the renegades that was at the bottom fighting all the way, all the way up and up and up until people were listening, um, about 15, 20 years ago. And it's hard. It's a very hard process. So to your other question, Part of my work is actually helping internal communications for anyone that we're working with. How are you navigating these systems? How are you educating across the company um, in the C-suite so that you're building teams that are um, multi-functionality um, and, you know, from different perspectives are really invested in the success of what you're trying to do? Right, right. Thank you. Thank you. That's fascinating. I feel like you and I could probably have a two hour conversation. Yes. Yes. We, we have to watch. Out. <laughs> we'll do that bilaterally. Yes. Dan Daniela, you, uh, you, you are, you have a number of different uh, spheres of action in, in your, your company, but I'm, I'm especially interested in the uh, economic, ethical and environmental sphere what kind of mindset shifts do you experience there? And, and also, the, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your company and, and what purpose means for that organization. Uh, I think you're muted. Yes, sorry. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so hello, and hello, Matthew and Rui de Moraes. Hi, thank you for joining. Um, <clears throat> well, First of all, I think uh, I'll start that Topon, so the company I created was created in 2011 with a base of thought, a kind of a philosophical approach that anything you do, any activity you do, has to be aligning with economic, ecological and ethical value development. I stayed away exactly what you said also, Michael. I stayed away from the kind of, you know, cradle to cradle religion because at the end of the day, there are thousands of participants out there that need to transition. And we do have, we saw a little bit during the last years now that there came a little bit of religion up, which, uh, I mean, I don't have to philosophize about but what religion can do. So um, I don't think it's a really, uh, that wouldn't be a good development. So everybody needs to transition and that complexity we just wrote on top of everything. And we are trying to, on the company level, we are helping companies grow and scale. So companies that are economic, ecological and ethical or direct, indirectly e environmentally active because of their economic and ethical 
doings. These companies we support and we try to grow and scale the small and mid cap sector. We're disrupting with another innovation, the VC sector on trying to avoid the serious A to C game that is going on because we do think that has led to a very strong kind of conglomerate development, which is not healthy for small mid caps, nor for families, nor for mothers and children to kind of really prosper in the different economies of the world. We have further also developed a fintech on the base of that, which is doing top-down approach in analyzing capital markets based on fintech technology and created a multi-serial lever levels of filters on it that is then machine driven and machine and man are joining hands to develop investment strategies that are again developing economic, ecologic and ethical values. And ESG is a tick the box, but I don't think it will fulfill the purpose. I do think from a thinking level, we do need to look at the timelines. The timelines today of the planet, if we calculate down, is not, you know, they're not endless. And I do think any activities, especially that the large corporates need to make and the small ones to kind of gear up onto, is to also keep the timelines in a certain kind of perspective of fulfillment, uh, call it the environmental fulfillment, the ethical fulfillment and the economic fulfillment. At the other point of view, we are moving capital in the right direction. That has been done since 10 years. That is, as said, on the one hand, growing and scaling small mid-cap businesses. On the other hand, doing the top-down approach with capital market strategies so that we really get as much transactions in the right direction as the percentage of transaction going in the right direction is still not uh, that impressive uh, if you refer to what's going on actually out there. So um, that's what we do. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you for that. Yes. All purposeful. <laughs> okay. Yes. And, and I, I wonder, what about, there, there must be a kind of a shift in mindset that takes place with a, a lot of the, the companies and investors you're, you're dealing with. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how yeah. you <laughs> deal with that. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody everybody transitions at different points in time right and like when i started in 2011 and some people started much earlier than me but that was still when a lot of people called me crazy to say that the world is going to be business as triple e right that was like especially me coming from the investment banking they were going danny are you trying to build a child crash or being philanthropic and i said no it's real business so that it's real business that there is an alignment with um also a legal framework you are suddenly needing to dedicate to that was thought of being impossible at that time right and how do they transition some people were complete pioneers they, they transitioned very quickly already during these times and were doing kelp growing in the ocean for co2 they were you know they were going into the everglades growing in the everglades etc they were doing all these kind of jobs that everybody still thought were crazy right and some started transitioning now some are not even there yet you can have conversations still today where somebody says climate change is anyways a marketing tool and I don't know what, you know, so you have them all somewhere starting to understand or never understand, whatever. And uh, but the majority is transitioning. But I do think the transition process of minds, families, large old families that are starting to be either also inspired by their youngster generation that is coming and saying, hey, we want to do it differently. But that's not the only one, right? There are also kind of uh, very old individuals that are finally seeing that if they go on the next hundred years like this, we won't be here anymore, right? And and so there, are, I I wouldn't give it a clear black and you know white thing that this group is and this group is not. I think everybody's transitioning, and we just have to be hopeful that it the time is still enough to get them all on board, right? And I do think actually there is much too much talking going on in sustainability. I think you can really just break it down to the transactions and make people responsible for what they're doing along the supply chains and basta la pasta, right? So I really do think um, the complexity um, of what we could do every day is not that high that we couldn't take multiple more action than we're taking today. Yes, totally agree. And thank you for that. On, on the other hand, 
as I think the example I, I, I just gave about the sustainability people with the chemicals company reveals is that there are no quick fixes and we really need to accept that this is, this is going to be a lot of work and we need to be more diligent about supply chains. Quite well, often. I mean, I'm sorry if I jump in here quickly sure, for last please. and then I'll be quiet. But, you know, that's a huge excuse always that everybody says, you know, it's not that easy and we need a lot of work and la la la. And but, I mean, look at the pandemic. As soon as something happens, I mean, whatever you think about the pandemic, we won't go into this. Right. But whatever you think about the pandemic, it shifted a lot and very quickly. Right. Yep. And so this is an excuse. I mean, we can do this very quickly. Everything we can do. We can even feed the whole world very quickly if we take the right steps. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the question is really how prepared are we to stay on this planet or how prepared are we all to just kind of jump the cliff? I guess. I mean, you know, it's 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 for me, these these huge events of talks and talks and political and whatever. All, I mean, find the guys and girls that are not really, you know, aligning with what needs to happen to be responsible. Yes. Yes. Well said. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we're just, we've got another 15 minutes and I'd like to take a brief opportunity to say thank you so much to Frank Jürgen Richter for organizing this, this incredible event. And I am honored and, uh, truly enjoying this con conversation with all of you. And having said that, I'd, I'd really like to leave the last words to, to you panelists. And I, I wonder if we could just maybe return, maybe in a more narrowly framed manner to this concept of the purposeful business. And I'd just like you to open up your minds and talk about your boldest visions for the purposeful business of the future. And again, for simplicity's sake, I'd just like to go clockwise. So, Andre? Thank you, Michael. Um, so yeah, look, this is a, a Pandora's box, I think, to, to start on that note. But I think that the point here is really what we're trying to do, the awareness of the world around me, specifically in the inequities of the region that within, within which you operate, had led me to realize that as much as I assumed a one ending, I realized unless we transform the basis of humanity, I come back to that same point, the, the building the purposeful business uh, really also described the building of a different humanity and a community in which we live. We cannot continue on the same trajectory. So you also can't create a hard stop in mid-sentence or in mid-stride. So I decided we have to take a 100-year vision. And I don't think we think often enough longer term. So I said, if you challenge ourselves and we take a 100-year vision, I can see from the hundreds of women we train and the impact that they're having on their communities. We call them community shapers. Our belief is that if we structure this correctly as a business and we can actually reach eventually tens or hundreds of millions, the opportunity to transform economy with ecology, because we also have a, an earth stewardship program we're designing that teachers will be describing and coaching. We might be doing this in conjunction with Harvard. We're also going to be allowing teachers everywhere the ability, the opportunity to train and inspire children early in life to understand many of these dynamics, which we're trying to do by coaxing older businesses and, and slightly older people to reframe the way they think. It's much easier to do that early on. And giving our children better values will, in fact, become a more purposeful future in terms of societal development. So, you know, most things I always say lead to Rome. And in this instance, I, any conversation I have, I can take it back to early childhood because the origins of who we are today largely began in the earliest years. And it's a massive enterprise. And I remembered in our conversation the other day, Canada <laughs> taken a huge step by budgeting over 30 billion in their budget for early care. Uh, that's a massive sta statement uh, by a country, in fact, in transforming and being more purposeful as a society. I think they've taken a really good purposeful and very practical step. So I believe that if we really transform that early year, we will change the way we see the, the planet and our fellow human. Thank you. Thank you for that. Rogerio. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's, I have been thinking, I was taking some notes here, on the, and uh, it's... Um, it's an extremely interesting uh, debate, this one. And um, I would like to build up on Daniela's uh, 
and, and not going to speak with them. Um, sorry, I'm Natalie. Uh, one thing that has actually uh, the, this this pandemia has actually changed or fostered the change of the paradigm that we have today. So the paradigm is, is going to change for the organizations and therefore consumers will shift and we need to serve the consumers. Whatever organization exists to serve consumers. And what was in the very old days needs today are demands that exist and people and the purpose of the company needs to adapt to the demands of the consumers whom we are supposed to serve and to provide goods or services to them. Therefore, <clears throat> this transition that uh, was uh, mentioned by both Daniela and Natalie, uh, and they put a lot of emphasis on this one, this transition period from brown to green, this is a transition period. And from brown to green, uh, you need to fund transition. How do you finance transition? So this transition period requires a lot of investment and a lot of, of, of and I'm not going through that because it would be in itself a session. Um, but just to say that the capex that is required for the organizations to move from brown to green will affect, will create a contingent, quote unquote, liability on, on, on their future. And therefore, it, it poses a lot of questions. I mean, so there is, it is not possible to do it without the government or government's involvement in this transition. It is extremely important that governments take a view on this one and make sure that if they want as a politicians, so or policy makers, they must define what kind of society do we need going forward and they need, that's why they are politicians, it's to lead and to show the way going forward, the commitment to it. And organizations follow. Uh, in, this, in this case, I'm a firm, a firm defender of the private initiative and that uh, the, the, the private companies will move and make sure. But I don't think that if it is not possible to do it at this stage without a government support. So we continue to exist to serve our clients, our consumers. As we, in the past, there was ATMs. There were not ATMs. People, if you wanted to withdraw cash from the bank, you would go to the bank they will write a check and then, so the service is the same. Now you use ATMs or not, if you want to, to have cash, hard cash in your hand. So the support of the offer has changed, but the offer in itself to provide cash to the client has not changed. What has changed is the support that people, the organizations will have to do. The same will apply with artificial intelligence, the same will apply with the robotization. And the debate will be in the near future, very near future, is how to tax robots. So that's going to be the next challenge with the change of, of, of the organization. So the purpose of the company is still the same, but the way they use, so what's going to happen to that workforce? What's going to happen to the people that is going to be replaced? So what are the professions that are going, that, that, that are the kinds of professions that are going to evolve and become more important? Uh, with the paradigm, for instance, of the, of, of the companies. So what has changed, for instance, you're staying at home, what has increased? People are buying things in the internet, online. So it fostered the logistics business because the goods have to be delivered to the clients. Either the client goes to, it, to, to, to the shop or the shop goes to the client. So the thing is to deliver the goods. So this changing paradigm, will change the nature of the offer of the services that are going to be used. And other services, this transition period, is like moving from the uh, steam machine to the oil machine. So things are changing. And it's important to understand that 
The ones that believe that organizations are going to stay the same as they were before the pandemia, the purpose it will, will change as well. Mm -hmm. So, as they say, improvise and adapt. Yes, if, yes. If we are not capable of improvise and adapt according to the circumstances, organizations will be there. And the purpose is not set in stone. It's not a, a dog. The purpose evolves with the company and with the society and with the consumers and with things that are also evolving. Either they are ahead of the curve or behind the curve. Mm -hmm. Those who are ahead of the curve will succeed. Those who are behind the curve will be dragged to hell. So that's right. my final comment on this one. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So the, it's it's a, 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 a lot about change readiness. And I, I wonder, N Natalie, we, we're slowly running out of time. I'd like to hear from you and and from Daniela. Apologies for the time. <laughs> Please, Natalie, go ahead. I was just waiting to make sure you didn't want me to focus in on something. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Just to reframe the, the question, I'd like to uh, I'd like you to talk about your boldest visions for the purposeful business of the future. Yeah, um, I've really enjoyed the conversation too. And you know, one thing I I do think that there's opportunities um, for businesses that feel pushed into a corner there there is opportunities with businesses that are in a crash and burn moment they've done something either they're being lamb blasted on social media or some tragic thing has happened and it is an opportunity per, to pivot we've seen that um happen in the past few years so it doesn't necessarily need to be an enlightenment moment it can be okay, what are we going to do about this? And let's come together and, and think about charting a new course. And I think that we've seen some companies do that very successfully. Um, I just did, I did think it was important to say that. Um, for, for the boldest vision, um, it, it, I think it's, it, it's, there's two types of companies right now that I think are going to be successful. One is new emerging companies that are filling a gap, seeing the marketplace, seeing where the younger consumers are buying and how their purchasing power decisions are going, you know, to three cleaning products on the shelf. And one is in biodegradable, um, reusable plastics and is looking at the long-term harm to the planet and is taking care of their employees. Like that's how people are buying. Um, so that's like a new company that's coming in with that at the forefront. And then the other opportunity is for big, big cruise liners. You know, the big companies that take a lot to turn around that are, are realizing that maybe the levels of what they're creating are not sustainable and are working against them. And I think what you're finding is that when you actually dive into a PL and you look at your costs and your long-term planning, as long as you have a vision as a leader that it doesn't have to be your, just your quarterly returns. And you're really looking at like how you're going to put that stake in the ground and move this huge ship. Um, those are the other people that I think will succeed. So a bold vision is, is we need transformational leadership. This isn't a company is made of people. Um, it's a community and a city in itself. And we need to have leaders that are not afraid to see the future um, and act more like entrepreneurs. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I started my company because you have to be entrepreneurial in this um, endeavor. You have to be able to look and problem solve um, and be nimble and, and keep your eye on the horizon. And so for me, we need a new level of leadership and we're seeing it emerge, but not from everyone. And, you know, it's very easy at like a Davos, for example, to see where people are standing, who, who's there, um, mm. as they really want to dig in their heels and learn. And, and then, you know, the other uh, champagne halo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that, that champagne note, I'd like to pass the microphone to Daniela. Well, thank you so much. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, this wonderful session. And from a bold statement of vision, um, I do think we're an intermediation of economy. I think we're transitioning to an economy we don't even know. All of us don't know. Uh, I think the principles of profit generation, et cetera, will be gone. And there will be different principles. I'm not saying that I'm complete, you know, uh, going now in that corner, but I do see it coming. Um, I think it will be a golden age. 
but we have some some 10 to 15 if not 20 years to go to transition and i do think the politicians have to step back i don't think they have to step front i think the financing people have to get their gear act together again and start participating in making this change positively happen but i don't think that the politics should uh, steer that wheel um i think it becomes too polarized too regulatory and uh, lets the human rights become a flaw thank you okay well thank you so much for that so we have from the investment world we have two slightly different views about the role of government that's really interesting to hear and we've been listening to to Andre talk about education and this massive role of education and and and, and female entrepreneurship and uh, teaching equality to young people and of course Natalie with your purpose work it's very fascinating to to hear uh, about about what you're doing with blank space and that's it unfortunately Thank you. Thank you so much and bye for now. All the best. All the best. Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you guys likewise. Pleasure to meet you all. Thank and, you. Uh, again, thank you everyone for and, listening. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No, no. And thank you for listening as well. <laughs> Cheers. Bye bye. Bye for now. Bye.